Let us go to 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, we've already had the 103rd Psalm read, so let's go to 2 Corinthians 9. And I'm going to read verses 6 to 15. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies need to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can hoard it up for yourself, save it up, keep it all to yourself so that you can have a nice fancy return. Oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> I got off track there. You <laughs> That's a different version. <coughs> You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surprising grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Halloween was just this past Monday, and yet last weekend I saw my first Christmas commercial on TV. Did you see that? I happen to know that for some of you this drives you crazy, doesn't it? But I actually saw Halloween stuff up at the end of August. I have a neighbor on my street that loves Halloween so much and puts out so much stuff that she begins in August to put up the stuff for Halloween. Now, I don't know about you, Maybe you love Christmas so much that you don't mind walking into the Hallmark store and seeing the Christmas trees up in September. Uh, but I just think it's the stuff they start Okay? But here's what I'd like you to think about. Even though Thanksgiving comes once a year, it is never too early to say thank you. The Thanksgiving holiday and spirit and attitude is appropriate all year round. Isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Now, if I ask you here at church, make a list of the things that you are thankful for. Write them down on a piece of paper. I'm pretty sure I'd get responses that talk about your relationship with God and ports of God in your life. But if somebody were to catch you at the mall on Tuesday and ask you to make a list of the things that you're thankful for, you might not be so religiously inclined, maybe you would, but I'm thinking you might say, well, I'm thankful for my health, thankful for my family, I'm thankful for my children, I'm thankful for my job. There's a good chance the average person would mention God at church, but maybe not outside. Thanksgiving, when we hear the word, be honest, the mental picture comes up, a cornucopia of blessings on the table, overflowing. All right? The family around the table, the aroma of the stuffing, the turkey, sweet mare's homemade pie. That's what comes to our mind, right? When we think about Thanksgiving, think about God, I'm glad I'm making enough money to pay my bills, supply my needs. There is a hymn, an old hymn. If you're old like me, maybe you know it. It's the title of it is Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. 
Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. And if we were to count our blessings, like I have on the sign out front, instead of our problems, it would cause us to be much more thankful, wouldn't it? Now, what about the person that's come upon some hard times? What have they got to be thankful for? The person who recently found, found out themselves or a friend or a relative was diagnosed with cancer or is facing an upcoming surgery. Is that person left out? Do they also have reason to be thankful? What about the person that's going to be eating Thanksgiving dinner alone this year because the one that they have loved for so many years died six weeks ago? Are they left out of being thankful? What if you just recently lost your job and the upcoming Christmas season isn't much cause for rejoicing? What's the basis of being thankful in those situations? Well, the Bible has two levels for us. One, obviously, first, although not most important, is the basic level for the provisions of life. I've got clothes to put on my back. I've got a comfortable bed to sleep in. I've got a roof over my head. It doesn't leak. And I'm not wondering where my next meal is coming from. But there's a deeper level of thanksgiving. And that, obviously, is our relationship with God. The first one's important. I mean, we need something to eat, we need something to wear, we need a place to live, a place safe to sleep. But the second one is more important. Praise the Lord, O my soul, we read in the 103rd Psalm. The Lord's love is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, in 2 Corinthians here, Paul told these folks, and since this is God's word, he's also telling us that we are supplied with the necessities of life so that we in turn can help somebody else. He gives to us so that we can help the poor. It was through his poverty that we become rich in our relationship with God. So when we make our list of what we're thankful for, whether we're here at church or at the mall, our relationship with Christ ought to be first. I read a story of a guy by the name of Henry Newen who was living in Paraguay and he knew a doctor. And the doctor, because of his education, because of his income, was considered just a little above the average person. We might say, in order to uh, tie in with current events, he was considered part of the 1%. And there was a lot of jealousy and a lot of envy especially on the part of the, the folks in the town who were connected to the police department. And they happened to uh, catch his son in a minor infraction. And so they took him and they locked him in jail where they beat him, burned him with lit cigarettes, and eventually ended up killing him because of the torture that he went through. Well, when he died, of course, his mother wanted to clean him up, put him in a suit, uh, so that they could you know, put him in a casket and uh, have a nice funeral. But the father, the doctor, said, no way. And on the day of the funeral, he drugged the bloody mattress down the center aisle of the church and threw it in front of the, the front of the church Brought, carried his son's crippled, tortured, now rigor mortis, deformed body in and laid it down on the mattress and said, this is what they did to my son. I'm one of you. I feel grief like you feel grief. And it took on a whole new respect. They took on a whole new respect for him. Realizing that Though he was more educated, though he was more well off financially, he was just like them. Now think that in relation to what God has done for us through Christ. Christ took on our faith. The doctor took on the face of the people in that town, and Christ, and God, through Christ, took on ours. He's one of us. 
and they tortured him, and they killed him. And so when you look at the face of Christ on the cross, we don't see a God who doesn't understand us, who is way off there, doesn't care, sits back and watches the people he created just do stuff without any intervention, but we see a God who is one of us and grieves like we grieve. That is something to be thankful for. It puts him among us and in our shoes. It might cause you to say, no matter what circumstance I find myself in, I can thank God for coming down to my level and proving that he is concerned about me. Again, back to the 103rd Psalm. Praise the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. When Paul wrote to the folks in the second letter to the Corinthians that we read, he told them that a real spirit of thanksgiving is enlarged not by, because we receive more from God, but because we're able to help and give away to others what God has given to us. But you know, there are a lot of folks that just aren't happy with what God has given them. I want more. I want better. I want bigger, and I want newer. Right? I'm not happy with what I have. I want something else. Well, be happy you're not married to the guy who's a football fan. Every time there's leftovers on the table, he refers to them as replays. But that's not quite as bad as the uh, TV executive who, when he has leftovers in front of him, he calls him reruns. But that's still not quite as bad as the mortician who, when he has leftovers in front of him, I'm sorry, I have to do this, he calls them remains. <laughs> <laughs> Or how would you like to be the guy who gave his wife a beautiful skunk coat for Christmas? Actually, skunk makes a good, nice, I mean, you know. And she put it on and she was dazzled by it. And she said, I just can't believe something so wonderful and soft and nice comes from such a hairy, smelly beast. And he said, look, look. You don't have to thank me, but I demand respect. Where's the drummer? <laughs> Not everybody's happy with the provisions God has given them. Now, for those of us who are, and I do hope that's everybody here, when we realize what God has done for us, it triggers joy. It triggers gratitude. And it triggers generosity so that we want to share with others. The Corinthians were going to take up an offering to help saints in other locations, other Christians that weren't as well off as they were. Paul was bragging about them every place he went, about their generosity. Even though they themselves were poor, they welled up in generosity and gave to help others. And he said what they're doing would overflow in many expressions of thanks to God. In other words, they, by their generosity, were causing other people to be thankful. We realize what we have and what we're blessed with. Out of thanksgiving, we give. That causes someone else to also be thankful. Now you know before you came in here this morning that Thanksgiving, while it's one day, the attitude of Thanksgiving is much more than about one day. All right? You knew that. But like a lot of things, we need to be reminded of some stuff that's good, right? That's why I wanted to start off the whole month with an attitude of Thanksgiving. I didn't want to wait till the Sunday before Thanksgiving although I will talk about something again then. But I thought, why not start the whole month? Why not make this a month of giving thanks? Because proper thanksgiving will bring us back to God. It reminds us of how important He is in our life. It helps us to be thankful to, for Jesus and to Jesus. It takes on a whole new dimension. Then if we're facing death, if we're facing hardship, 
If we're unemployed, if we're having a hard time, we don't stop being thankful. My attitude of thanks for God and my relationship with Him through Christ is not based upon what I have. It's based upon Him. Is it any wonder that when Paul saw that kind of faith in his letter to the Corinthians, he said this, Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift! Exclamation point. Everything else is just things. And they're good, and we need them, and we need to be grateful for them. But in Christ, we have a reason to be thankful every day, don't we? Faith, eternal life, help along the way, that's the real thanksgiving. Is it ever too early for that? We can be thankful in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, and start all over again. Now, I made a purchase that I'd like to share with you. On the uh, communion table here, I have all kinds of thank you cards. These are Thomas Kincaid thank you notes. I know some of you like him. These are just some nice yellow ones, purple ones. These are uh, Heartline. I don't know what that is. But I've got all kinds of things. And what I wanted to do was, uh, after we sing our last song, uh, I would like any of you that are so inclined to come up. I have enough for one box or one package for family, not one per person, okay? Come up and take one after church is over. But with this caveat, use them. Okay? Use them. Write thank you notes to each other. Somebody gives you something just because you wanted to tell someone, I thank you that you were born. If you would, and this is not a requirement for you to take one, but if you would, also use one to write something you are thankful for and put it in the box that's out there where we have the bulletins every week, and I will use those on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. You can sign it if you want. If you do sign it, I will use your name. If you want to write something and you don't want your name used, don't sign it. Because you're thanking God, not me. Okay? But for some reason, you may want your name on there. All right? All right, let's pray. Lord, we have many, many reasons to be thankful. First and foremost to you. But also for brothers and sisters in Christ. For the many things that are done for us on our behalf to help us. Help us to have attitudes of thanksgiving all this month and indeed all year round. 